I love hearing the choir. It takes me back to a Sabbath when uh, San Diego Academy Choir was asked to sing for a big event at the Orange Showgrounds in San Bernardino. And HMS Richards was speaking, not Junior, the old dude. And uh, Del Delker was singing and the King's Hairs were there, you know, and every, it was, it was an event. And we were singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic as part of the presentation. And I remember Mrs. Pulliam, our director, looked at me and said, all right, it's your, almost your time. She had me singing the solo in the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And so you get this, everything swells to this marvelous moment. And it's my turn. And I had no idea what the words were. None. And so I went, la, 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 And I la, 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 all the way through the solo. <laughs> and then I sat down in abject humility. <laughs> and please, God, open a hole. <laughs> I'm, while, while HMS was uh, preaching, Del Delker slipped out of her chair and came back and sat down beside me on her knees because I was in a crowd. And she put her arm up over me and she said, Dick, I want you to know I've sung La 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 seven times in my life. <laughs> and you did it beautifully. <laughs> and I, from then on, we became very good friends over the years and, uh, you know, what did she teach me that day? Well, I know what Mrs. Pulliam taught me. You will carry an index card. <laughs> and I know what Del Delker taught me. Love trumps all. It really does. Kindness. And Del Delker was a consummate kind woman. Beautifully done. Thank you for reading the scriptures so beautifully today. It's, I chose that scripture because of spending time in Michelle Pinado's office and of walking around campus and of realizing over the last few years there are a few broken pieces at PAA, a, a lot of them. And as I walked around campus, and as I listened, and as I talked to Kent and other teachers and students, it kept coming back to something Michelle told me. And I want to start right there, because I think it's a lot like Nehemiah. When you ask Michelle Panato, what is your mission? Not the school's mission. I want to know your personal mission at Portland Adventist Academy. Well, here's the direct quote. I want every student here to know and experience in every way possible that Jesus totally adores them. Now, how many times have you read a school mission that included the word adore? Never. I haven't, and I've helped many schools create them. Never thought about including the word adore. And then I listened to Michelle talk about it a little more, and, and she added this extra phrase. The only way this will ever work is if every adult in the school totally adores them. Now, would you like to send your kids to a place where the principal's goal is for every person here to understand and experience the adorational love of Jesus Christ in their lives. And the only way they can do that is if every teacher, not just teacher, even Kent, and all of the other staff, everybody around, totally adores those kids. I'd like to send my kids here. In fact, last year, our daughter, uh, Juline, allowed us to bring Gwen 
from New Zealand to spend four months at PAA. And I want to tell you, that was a good experience. It was so hard for her to go home. There were girls from the school holding on to her, trying to make her miss her plane. Her heart was breaking. A few days ago on the phone, I said, Gwen, you want to come? What is your dream for Christmas? And she said, I want to come back to PAA. She didn't say, I want to see you, Grandpa. <laughs> she missed that part. There's something that happens when you are in an environment of kindness and safety, which Michelle would define as an environment of adoration. It's awesome. So let's go look at Nehemiah for a minute. I, I love his story because it is unique in Scripture. In fact, if you go to the book of Nehemiah, many commentators say that it's the happiest book in the Bible. There's no big disasters. Every, God wins and the people win all the way through. It's really kind of special. And it all ends in a giant party on the walls of Jerusalem. Ezra leading a choir one direction. Nehemiah leading a choir another direction. And everybody remembering the words. Yeah. <laughs> There's four things that I learned from Nehemiah chapter 1 and chapter 2. Here's the first verse. In the monk of Kislev, in the 20th year, he was 20 years old when this book happened. While I was in the citadel of Susa, and look that up, Google it when you get home, so you can understand that what Susa was like in the year 445 BC. Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. Uh, Nehemiah was born in Susa. He hadn't been over there. Hananiah, we don't know about. He likely was born in Susa also. But his Bible teacher or pastor took them on a tour of Israel. And so they had gone over and they had wandered through all of Israel. They got to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, they'd seen and experienced. And now he's home telling Big Brother what it was like. When Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with all the other men, I questioned them. What's it like over there? And they said, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned by fire. The next words that Nehemiah wrote talked about God. They didn't talk about, well, what's wrong with the people over there for not building the stupid wall? They're smart. They should have had a fundraiser. They should have sold pies. They should have, how come? He didn't argue about any of that. He focused immediately on God and said, loving Father, who have taught us to adore you and love your commands. And then he pleads with God to do a miracle in Jerusalem. I find that's what's happening at PAA. It would be very easy to, to just spend your time complaining about potholes. Or to say, you know, we've got to... No, there was none of that. Give it to Michelle, give it to this staff, give it to these kids. And the first thing they do is they look up to God and they say, okay, you who adore us, we're choosing to adore you. And thanks for being here at the party. That's the way Nehemiah dealt with the disastrous news. He got when Hananiah came home from Jerusalem and said, that place is awful. Yeah. So? And Nehemiah immediately started trying to find ways to bless the people who were living inside the burned walls of Jerusalem. I think he made a lot of plans. You know, we don't know a whole lot about Nehemiah. He kind of jumps into scripture. We know two really important pieces, however. He obviously was a good administrator. And he was trustworthy. The king said, look, 
if you followed anything about the politics of my kingdom and the men who came before me and the ones who would like to come immediately and take my job, you'll know that there's a good chance I'm going to be poisoned. And so I'm going to put you in charge of everything I eat and drink, okay? And I want you to test it all before I eat it because I'm going to trust you to make sure nobody's poisoning me. You'll be my cupbearer. And so this 20-year-old kid, I don't know how many years he was in the job, but at this point, he'd been there long enough to be well-respected and honored. King Artaxerxes knew this was somebody on his side. So Nehemiah puts together the plan. You know, it's, it's kind of like, I think he had Hannah and I and some of the other guys help him, and they work on it, and they say, well, what are we going to need? Well, you got to get, first of all, they burned everything on the walls. And so the walls are not just broken down. They are rocks that have been burned, and there's no wood anymore at all. The bars and the beams are all burned down to nothing. You're going to need all kinds of good cedar to do that, and you're also going to need, and he starts making a list of all the supplies, this is in Kent's office and the bottom right-hand drawer, by the way. And uh, all of the things that are needed to be able to fix the place. And then he thinks, but, but more than that, I've got to get there to be able to do it. And so I'm going to need some help. Man, it's dangerous out here. If you can think about going to where Susa is, it's just in Iran. It would go up over the mountains, through the desert, over the mountains, through the desert. You come in about at Baalbek in Lebanon, and you go down the river, and then you come down to Joppa. This is a nasty trip, and it's full of all kinds of marauders, and who knows who. The bandits live there, and when. And Nehemiah says, I'm going to need an army to go over there, not to fight, but to protect me and the people who will be building the wall. You see, Nehemiah didn't just say, i got to go over there and do something. No, he said, here's a wise plan. And the guys all got together, they agreed on it. And then Nehemiah started realizing this may never happen in his mind. And God loves that city and the people. And he's thinking about that one morning as he serves the king. And he's praying the same prayer he's prayed every day for years. Well, for four months, forgive me, since he heard the problem. And his prayer is, God, help me say the right thing to the king. And the king looks at him and says, do you already drink my morning wine? Uh, yes, I tasted it, sir. Why are you sad? Your countenance says there's something wrong. Is there poison in my cup? Oh, no, my Lord. No poison in your cup. It's in, it's in my heart. What's wrong? Oh. King, my home where my parents are buried, where, 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 and he goes back through the history of Israel, where King David, it's, the city is broken down, it's a mess, and I just, I am so sad about that. And the king and his wife, uh, Damascia, I think was her name, lean over and say, what do you need? And Nicodemus knows the hook has caught and God has opened the door. Well, let me show you what I need. And he pulls out the plan. And he lays it before the king. And the king says, how long will this take? Well, that's on page 7. It's going to take that long for me to get over the mountains and over the desert. And besides that, I can't go alone. I'm going to need some real support. And if it's possible that I could have a cavalry troop and uh, several chariots. And I need letters that go to all of the, the authorities all along the way so they will protect me from the bandits. Uh, and I don't know how long it'll take. It may take a couple years. It may take 10 years to get the actual wall built. But I need your help to pull it off. And the king said... You've thought this through so well, I'm going to trust you and your God to pull it off. I see so much of PAA in Nehemiah's experience. 
Yeah. If you've got a problem, lean on God. He's the only guy with the real answers. And then make a plan for fixing it. Don't just sit in your office and weep and wail and be afraid and sad and angry. And don't just blame the people over there. No, figure out a solution. And then take it to the authorities. There's an intriguing little corner in this story that, in, that just really raises my fascination. During COVID, remember we all shut everything down, life kind of stopped. But there were certain organizations that did not stop. They kept going on and on and on. And, and they kept teaching kids. And they, in, at PAA, it was almost overnight. We went from students shouting in the hallways to students watching on video. I mean, what a disaster. Handled beautifully at PAA. So the treasurer of our school spent a little bit of time thinking about that, got on the uh, Google aspects and found solutions and discovered that there was some money for organizations that kept going during COVID. It's like saying, we have a plan, but boy, it needs to be funded a little bit. And so she went ahead and filled out all of the necessary documents. And then the check came. More than 600,000 United States dollars to say thank you, to say we're proud of you, to say that was an expensive adventure, wasn't it? We will help. Now, there's no strings on it. It's, it's one of those things where, just like Artaxerxes, he didn't say, and you need to be back here by 7.30 on the... No, it, it wasn't any of that. It was, that's a good idea. Do it. And in our case, it was a good idea. Do it. It paid the bills. It made it possible to keep going. It made it possible for this school to be a place where you can come today and sit in chairs and cheer your memories and your hopes all together. How cool is that? Well, Nehemiah didn't stop there. After planning and getting it all put together, Nehemiah decided that he couldn't do it alone. It needed everybody. And the only way to get everybody on board is to honor them. Because you, and what word am I going to use? Adore them. There's something that happens in an organization when the leader adores the people around. All of those people cluster in. They move towards rather than away. Fear dissipates. If you read the book of Nehemiah, you don't find the people in the city afraid. The people you find afraid are the people outside the city who are losing power. And they say, wait, 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 you can't do that. You can't build that wall. You can't." You can't. And Nehemiah says, excuse me, we're busy. <laughs> I love Nehemiah's smiling Go away, answer. And he used everybody. Uh, when you get home, just if, I want you to just read chapter 3 to yourself sometimes. Uh, Eliasabeth was the high priest. He and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it. They set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel, and the men of Jericho joined them. Now, I don't know what you think, but Jericho's far enough from Jerusalem. It's going to be hard to get the Jerichites to come up here and help build the wall of a broken down city that isn't theirs. Nehemiah got them. And the priests. Those are probably the last people that you're going to ask to build. There isn't a priest out there that knows anything about laying block. They know a lot of other stuff, but they're not, they're not block layers. And Nehemiah says, look, I've got a couple of guys who will teach you everything you need to know. Would you be willing to do this little section of the wall? And the high priest said, no, I'm busy. God didn't train me to do that. No, he said, 
Look, when I was at Portland Adventist Academy, they taught me to do anything God asked me to do. We can do this. Yes. And they went to work. And I love the list of the people. Then you've got the men of Jericho who are helping. And then you've got the sons of Hassanana who rebuilt the fish gate. The beams, the doors, the bolts, the bars. I mean, it gets really specific. If you read chapter 3, it's Nehemiah accepting the Oscar from Artaxerxes. You know how the people who accept the Oscar, they always stand there and they say, okay, this wasn't about me. Let me tell you all the people who made it possible. Chapter 3 is the made it possible chapter. And this is Nehemiah's speech. And then there was, uh, let's see, and then there were the men of Tekoa. Man, they worked hard. But the nobles from Tekoa, they refused to work because they wouldn't let anybody supervise them. So we just worked around them. And then it goes on and on and on and on. His speech would have been cut off in the middle by CNN. Too long. But at Artaxerxes' court, everybody listened and everybody cheered. Because it was a speech worth hearing. It said, you cannot lead alone. You cannot stand before the people. Give them a great mission. And then tell them to get it on. No, you got to inspire and you have to work on the wall beside them. And it happened that way all the way through. Nehemiah and everybody else, it got to the point where in one hand they carried a trowel to take care of all the work that needed to be done on the stonemasons, and in the other hand they carried their semi-automatic for all the enemies who were coming their way and hassling them and hounding them. Because you see, good work always generates opposition. But he was ready for that. He'd already worked that out with Artaxerxes. He had the cavalry with him. And all he had to do was just ride around and say, good morning, guys. And everybody worked harder and better, and the enemies said they had other appointments they were busy with. Shalom, who was ruler of half of Jerusalem, built a huge section of the wall, at least a mile along with his daughters. It's cool. Doesn't matter who you are. God needs you right here, part of the team, and we've got a spot where you fit perfectly. That's the way people who adore others work together and do miracles. Uh, Last night we were talking with our daughter Joy in Southern California. We have a six-year-old grandson, Seamus, down there. And uh, she asked what I was talking about. And I told her, and she said, you need to know what Seamus did yesterday. Seamus? No, I won't tell him. Well, Seamus got in a little trouble at school. So on the way home, I asked him how he felt about it. And Seamus said, All my good behaviors are ahead of me. (laughs) And Joy said, I think he got that from Napoleon Dynamite. Remember there when Uncle Rico says, life's too short to dwell on missed opportunities. Focus instead on inventing new ones. (laughs) Make sure that the future is everything you dreamed and a little bit more. Yeah, that's part of this whole Nehemiah process. It's part of everything I know about PAA. Uh, One time, a woman knocked on my door at Florida Hospital. I was vice president for mission for 22 campuses, and uh, chaplains are really important people in that process. And Ruby came in and she sat down in my office and she said, Dick, I got to tell you something that just happened to me. I said, what? She said, it's just so weird. 
You know how you've told us that we've got to be ready for anything, and no matter what happens, we've got to make sure that there's room for God in the experience. Yeah? So I, I got a call to go up to, uh, to our oncology unit on this campus, and when I got up there, I knew what was going on. Grandma's been there. She's got cancer. She's dying. I'm afraid it's, I was, I knew it was going to take her sooner or later. And I was afraid that meant that it was just about now. And so I went up and this is a family that has decided to be with grandma at the same time. There's a ton of nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and others. And so when I got to the door, I just said, God, walk in ahead of me. I opened the door. There were 13 people in that hospital room. And that didn't include grandma or me. So now there's 15 of us. And there isn't room for that many people in a hospital room. None. There's too many, uh, there's, there's too many little tables covered with weird devices and beeping. And you know what a hospital's like. She said, I stood there and backed, the door closed and I kind of backed up against the wall. I've met some of these people before, but they ignored me completely. I just leaned up against the wall and prayed, God, give me a way to show your love. Boom, the door opened. And it wasn't a nice, soft, hello, I'm your nurse. No, it was just, boom, the door opened. And in walked the hospital cookie lady. Now, at that hospital, we, we would uh, bake really fresh cookies, and we would let one of the volunteers in her bright pink uniform deliver them. And so she's got a silver tray piled with macadamia and chocolate chip and chocolate chip and other stuff. And it's just ginger snaps, and they're all there. And they smell like they came just out of the oven. And she opens the door, and she says, Hello! Anybody here want a cookie? One thing about this volunteer is that she was uniquely unable to sense where she was. Her job was to deliver cookies happily and to spread cheer, and she was at it. Well, it wasn't a good cheer moment, and the uh, chaplain lady said, oh, I leaned against the wall and said, no, not her, Lord, <laughs> please, no. Now I've got two problems. How do I get her out of here? Well, the lady, everybody in the room just ignored her. Well, they kind of looked at her and then ignored her. She was not a welcome presence. So I said, does anybody here want a cookie? And now she's angry that they didn't take cookies. I mean, I'm really sorry, ma'am, but... And about that time, a 16-year-old grandson left the side of the bed, walked over to the tray, reached up, took the biggest chocolate macadamia nut, walked over to Grandma, set it on her chest, and said, Hey, Grams, you want a cookie for the road? <laughs> and everybody in the room did exactly what you did. They burst into laughter. What do you do? I mean, that is just such an inappropriate, wonderful comment. <laughs> and the cookie, um, Ruby got the cookie lady out of there as fast as she could. And then all of the rest of the people, th there are two sisters who have not talked for a year because last year you didn't invite me to Thanksgiving. Well, I didn't want you to think, you know, that kind of thing. And those two ladies are in arms crying over grandma and... The place dissolved from anger and frustration and hostility to joy and happiness and laughter. And all because of a teenage kid who did something dumb and it worked. And Ruby sat there and she said, I just cried when I, she died that day and we just had a, we couldn't decide whether to have a funeral or a party. She said that was about six months ago. And today I was walking down Church Street just a little while ago in Orlando. And I saw a man across the street who looked at me and shouted and said, Ruby! And dashed across the street to me and said, Chaplain, I want to thank you for bringing the cookie lady with you to our room. 
That was the best thing that has ever happened to our family. We get along now, we laugh and talk, and whenever somebody starts to get stressy and cracked, somebody else will say, hey, you want a cookie for the road? <laughs> and everybody dissolves and we say, there's no problem with having that much trouble. Come on, how do we fix this? That's what happens when God's adoration fills you and you help others enjoy it. You believe that? I do too. So I got one more little thing for you. Years ago, when I was young, uh, I found a friend who makes bows and arrows. And he makes his experience and his reputation in life is as a traditional archer. Indians, uh, First Nation people around the United States come to him to be sure they're doing it right because he's studied and he's just wonderfully expert. And so he asked me one day to bring my family and come up and visit him in Mifflinville, Pennsylvania, where he had his uh, assembly line in the attic of, a, of an old Dutch barn. So I went up and he asked one of my kids, Julene, I think it was. Uh, there's some arrow shafts over there. Bring me one. And so she went to a large bundle of green rose uh, shafts. You know, roses do weird things. Every once in a while, they, they just send out a stick. And he says, bring me one of those. And so it was green. It just, he just picked it or quacked it a few days before. And so she went out and got it. And she says, this would make a good arrow because you can just bend those all around. You can tie knots in them. You, anything's possible. They're just useless. And he said, that one won't work, will it? Well, let me show you something. Go get one from that pile. And that pile is a year old. It's been in the attic of the barn for a year. They are dry. All the sap has leaked out. All that's left is the woody stuff. Break one of those for me. And so Julene tried, and she couldn't. And he said, that might make a good arrow. Let's work on that. And so he started working, and he took that arrow that had completely died. Nicodemus. You'll never be able to go to heaven unless you're born again. And all the stuff you are dies away so I can fill you with my stuff. And uh, he, my friend held the arrow up and he said, this one's dead so I can use it. And I'll fill it with my stuff. And so he dips it in oil. Olive oil works best, but bear grease works in a variety of other things, but olive oil works best. And soak it until the stick is absolutely filled with oil. What does oil represent in the Bible? Holy Spirit. Okay, so I'm making an arrow because God says in Jeremiah, you are a polished arrow. I've made you and I will put you in my quiver. And so my friend says, and you know, one of the other things you've got to do right away is you've got to put a point on it because what's an arrow without a point? What's a life without a purpose? And then you've you got to put feathers on it. And he said, I like macaw feathers. There were a lot of those that were brought up in from Mexico to the Anasazi, the Pueblo, and the Fremont people. And when you dig and you find arrows, you very often find macaw feathers on them. And he says, so I draw some lines. I make it pretty. And I add a fluff. And a, Joy says, if you do that, does it make the arrow go faster? And he said, no, the, the fluff doesn't. But the, the uh, feathers do. And they make it spin so that it's kind of like rifling, you know. It, it goes faster and more direct. It actually goes straighter if I do the feathers, right? And then he said, but take a look at it. What do you think? And he pulled this one down off the shelf. And he said, here's one I've been playing with. You think it'll work? It had a bend in it. And there was, you know, nothing is perfectly straight. And so he said, oh, we got to fix that. Come here. 
And so we go downstairs through the barn out to the little creek behind his barn. And there's a fire burning, a little campfire kind of thing. And it's got uh, tongs on both sides. I kind of feel like I'm in a blacksmith world. And he takes this arrow and he lays it on the tongs so the fire is touching the place where it's bent. And Jeremy said, you're going to burn it. It's full of oil. It's just going to explode. And that made Julene really worry. And so now we're watching this. The flames are starting to lick around this. And it gets to the point where that arrow is going to go. And just about when it's ready to explode, he grabs it, puts it in his teeth, and straightens the place where it's got a crooked bow. What do you think, he says. And we all look at it and are glad we're not arrow makers. <laughs> Take it home, Dick. I have a full set and a quiver from my buddy David. And you know, every time I look at it, I'm reminded of two things. If I am full of me, I make a really bad arrow. Me got to go. Spirit's got to fill. And the only way that happens is if I know and experience in every way possible that Jesus totally adores me. And then I allow him to do what adore means. He fells me with his best. Now, the, the uh, verse of Jeremiah is really kind of weird because it says, and he is going to make of you a polished arrow and hide you in his quiver. And so on our way home that day, I think it was Joy said, Oh, no, we asked, we asked David, why do you, do you polish your arrows? Oh, yeah, by the hour, watching 49er games. <laughs> and he uses antlers, and it's obvious it works. They're really shiny. On the, in the car on the way home, the kid's thinking about it, looking at the arrow. And Julene says, it's not perfect. Why? And we all look at the arrows, and sure enough, none of them are perfect. They've all got dimples in them, here and here and here and here. They're little dimples. And Jeremy says the reason they're dimples is because that's where David kissed it to make it straight. It's right. Every place there was a light bend or crookedness in the arrow shaft, David straightened it at his own expense and left a dimple of love. So what have we learned? When Nehemiah went home, he showed iPhone pictures of a completed wall. Happy people, joyful celebration. And he looked at the king and said, there they are. Aren't they beautiful? Because to Nehemiah, every person deserved to know that God adores them. Just like a school I know. My last words to Michelle in her office a few days ago were, man, Sure wish I had a teenager I could send here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, when, when I worked for Dr. Malcolm Maxwell at PUC, Malcolm did something really interesting. He always wore a jacket when he preached. And the reason he wore a jacket is because over the years, Malcolm had learned 
that if you wear a jacket, people tend to slip $20 bills into the pocket, or $50 bills, or $100 bills, that they don't really want anybody to know they gave, but they wink when they come and give you a hug. God bless. Lord, we are here today to celebrate a school. Walls, floor, kids. Kids who know they're special because teachers remind them often. To celebrate teachers who know you're awesome because they've experienced your embrace. Lord, hug us close. Fill us with your spirit. If it takes fire, that's okay. Straighten us. Turn us into the very, very best possible for you. Amen.